only maybe 50 years ago or maybe roughly 50 years ago there was hundreds more uh, different types of rices available through uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia. Um, so many that you know you, if you looked at the images today you'd go is that really rice? And um, because of um, colonization and because of monopolization of um, the, the seed industry and so on, a lot of those varieties actually have already been lost forever. We need to make sure that that diversity continues because diversity means survival. What happens uh, if we have one type of rice? Well, maybe a, a parasitic fungus takes over the rice field and wipes out that whole entire species of rice and then we don't have any other seeds for other types of rice. You know, it's, uh, there's more survival with diversity. Next on the tour of the EDIT facility, James and Scylla introduced to me the problems that have arisen from today's agriculture industry. A lot of these seeds and varieties um, are being lost because of multi-million dollar seed companies dominating and monopolizing global seed sales. So if we create seed banks and surpluses of seeds that are rare, then we're preserving diversity for the future and, and we need diversity uh, for our um, planet's future. By maintaining polyculture systems, they ensure not only the survival of the diverse species of plants that are native to Bali, but the people of Bali in the event of a disaster. And, I, and you know, a lot of people think oh, permaculture is just about uh, farming or um, gardening or, or you know, um, composting and things like that. But uh, uh, permaculture, you know, when you look at the word, um, it's permanent culture and um, we're choosing and uh, discovering new ways um, of bringing together um, ancient knowledge as well as modern knowledge um, in survival. Um, in create, creating an abundant future that's not dependent on um, uh, the government and major uh, corporate interests. Um, so by empowering people and bringing community together, you're strengthening uh, the future of um, Indonesia and um, yeah, uh, really empowering people to uh, stand on their own two feet, which um, is why EDEP, I feel, is really important for um, the future of Indonesia. All right. Using like chemicals and fertilizer and stuff, is that just cheaper? Like, why do they do it? Why? Um, well, uh, actually, it, it doesn't end up being cheaper. Um, so when these companies, uh, the, the reason uh, these farmers use it is because the companies come in and they bombard uh, the media with uh, propaganda and um, they convince people like, oh, you know, they, they take over the advertising, they put all their products in all the shops and they make it very available and limit all the other products from being available. And so people are kind of almost forced to uh, take their product. Maybe initially they weren't, maybe initially they thought, oh, this is a new technology, great. Um, and in a lot of these Asian countries, it was known as the Green Revolution, where um, chemical agriculture was pushed upon uh, rural Asia and um, people were encouraged uh, to, to turn towards chemicals more um, and then next thing you know uh, people are going hang on a second uh, my crops aren't growing as well as I thought my soil's dead but now all our uh, old seeds aren't available anymore and um, we're kind of forced to use these genetically modified seeds um, and so they're trapped and, and um, I've spent a bit of time in India and in rural India there's been thousands of deaths by suicide through rural India by farmers who have um, lost their livelihoods due to turning to um, genetically modified seeds and um, how do they kill themselves? They drink the poison that um, the, the, the very poison, the very fertilizers and chemicals like Roundup which is a Monsanto product um, that they put on their crops. That's how they kill themselves. That's a very common way of them killing themselves and I'm sure it's been similar here in Indonesia in some cases as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, the local farmer here, they get a lot of subsidies from the government, maybe because of the government already have a good partnership with the company that produce fertilizer, chemical, uh, pesticides and some, yeah, some other things. Um, so they get it cheaper and yeah, actually the government is um, really, really supported like they they put this um, budget like national yearly budget for subsidizing 
the chemical pesticide, the chemical fertilizer. So that's why the organic vegetables in Indonesia mostly it's more more expensive than the one that use chemical. Mm. Yeah. So it's it's hard and it's our struggle to ask people to to bring people go back to organic and then stop using chemicals and start also eating organic. The main thing that I took away from this is that non-organic food is not only bad for your body, but there are greater global implications. If we continue down this path that we're on and we destroy this earth, our children aren't going to have anywhere to go. They're not going to have an earth to grow food. They're not going to have the resources they need to live. This land here, you're adding, uh, if you're adding chemicals like uh, nitrates, which are artificial forms of nitrogen, uh, then you're putting fake life into the soil for the plants to grow on, but the soil's dead. Um, but if you're um, uh, building the soil and the soil's alive and fertile and um, the plants are fixing the nitrogen and over time that soil's getting deeper and deeper, you're, you're building a future for your children. But if you um, are just tilling the soil, killing the soil, putting chemicals in it that kills the soil, then essentially you're using the dead bodies of microbes to feed the plants and feed your future and eventually those microbes are going to wash away into the river systems, those nitrates are going to go into our ocean, they're going to cause um, algae blooms in the ocean which are going to drown out our local reefs and um, yeah it's holistically it's not working so uh, we need to be working with uh, systems that um, are, are building life with what we have and creating an abundant future. The steady depletion of our natural resources, such as oil and topsoil, is a major problem as our society today is so dependent on fossil fuels. Topsoil loss is um, one of our biggest threats today, and people aren't even aware of it. You know, we're losing, um, uh, you know, ten, tens of thousands of tons of soil. You know, like on a very regular basis, and um, and if we allow all the topsoil to be lost. Uh, what are we going to grow our food on? You know, and there's some pl places like Central India. I worked in Bundelkhand in Central India, and um, we were working in areas where there's no topsoil left. It's almost rock, and so the people can't even grow food to survive anymore. And because there's no trees there, because there's no soil, trees keep the water table healthy. And so then the, they have to go deeper and deeper with their bore wells to get water. And so uh, you're looking at a, a major disaster: no water, no food. That's also happening in Haiti. You know where uh, the erosion is a uh, huge, huge issue there. The issues we have seen here are not just unique to Bali, but they're happening all around the world. Uh, the, the ideas of peak oil, um, which is going on to another subject, but I'll just touch on it briefly. Um, peak oil is the idea that we're actually um, now using more oil than we're actually finding. So we're starting to deplete the reserves of oil on the planet. and. Um, and that means that we've got to start thinking about a future without oil because there will come a time, maybe in our lifetime, maybe not, but in the future for our children for sure, where there's no oil. And if we're in a country that is uh, relying on um, huge amounts of fossil fuels to bring our food uh, and then all of a sudden that's cut off um, or you know, even over a significant period, there's got to be some form of transition. And I believe it's important in this time that we start to begin that transition um, to being reliant without fossil fuels, without oil, um, growing more localised foods that we use, then we're not going to have a disaster in the future where um, our foods aren't going to be available. Um, and that's everywhere, you know, um, in Australia, uh, without trucks driving around using huge amounts of fossil fuels, um, we wouldn't have food. People would starve. Um, so that's a good example. Singapore a country that relies completely on fossil fuels for its food. It's a country that is a city and everything needs to be shipped in. If fossil fuels disappeared tomorrow, which probably won't happen that fast, but if it did, then there would be a huge disaster in Singapore because nobody would have access to food. Everywhere we live, uh, scenarios are different. Um, uh, and a good example is um, putting pressure on your local council to create composting facilities. And um, in Lismore Council, in northern New South Wales in Australia, the council does actually uh, have a composting facility and you uh, put your compost in the bin and they take it away to this giant uh, heap, 
hot compost facility where they turn it into soil and then sell it back to the community very cheaply. So on a broad scale we need to be putting pressure on our governments um, to be creating better systems in our cities um, that allow the cities to function better.